All right, I'm just going to do a quick introduction for the, uh, for the next speaker. Um, Jeffrey Hammond uh, from Forrester Research is going to be talking about what, new development, new ALM, something like that. I'll take care of it. <laughs> um, he had, the one thing he has in common with Steve well, is uh, his love of beer. He's actually a beer maker, um, and he actually brought a few bottles along for us to sample. Well, me, to sample later. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Jeff. It helps when you're local. You don't have to worry about sneaking 22-ounce bottles through uh, TSA. So uh, um, I'm going to pick right off uh, where uh, pick right up where Stephen left off uh, because obviously with the kinds of changes uh, that we see in this space. Um, we've got to think about what that means for the software lifecycle. Uh, originally, this talk was uh, about ALM 3.0. Um, along the way, when I was putting the slides together, I decided to change the title because uh, uh, I think numbers are, are overrated. So instead, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, modern ALM. And uh, to just set the context a little bit, um, why would we need to change our application lifecycle management practices? Well, if technology were pretty much the same as it was for the past decade, past 20 years, we probably wouldn't because we've gotten pretty good at managing traditional systems uh, with our lifecycle management tools and practices. But uh, I think that what's driving the need to, to really reflect on what we're doing and how we're doing it is the change in technology that's brought on by so many of the things uh, that Stephen just talked about. Um, anybody know who this is? Shout it out if you do. Come on, Facemeyer, you at least ought to know this. You've seen the slide before. Um, this is Linus Pauling. Uh, Linus uh, Pauling is the father of modern biochemistry, at least here in the US, uh, the only person to ever win two solo Nobel Prizes. Um, one of the things I like about uh, Pauling, other than the fact that he invented hundreds of new compounds, chemicals, and made you know, hundreds of discoveries, uh, is the quote, the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas whether it's Pauling or Edison or Bacon or any of the other inventors before him, one of the things he understood is not every idea that you get is a home run. But if you can have lots of ideas, prototype them out, figure out which ones work, you can have ideas that make money. It's essentially the root of successful innovation uh, when it's not planned innovation. This is what we see in the software industry. If you look at how things are now, to how things were 10 or 20 years ago when I was, you know, one of 100 people at uh, Rational Software and we were getting off the ground, uh, the reality was back then uh, we couldn't have that many ideas when it came to enterprise software because kind of the minimum startup to really get off the ground was about $10 million. That's what, you know, an average A round might have been. And when you got that A round, what you did was you put about uh, $5 million of that into commercial software and commercial hardware. You went and bought lots of spark boxes. And then you put the other $5 million into building out an enterprise sales force that could go sell all your software. Well, the reality today, I would submit to you that innovating with ideas in software now costs a fraction of that, probably less than 500,000. As a result, we have the opportunity to test out a lot more ideas, which is exactly what Stephen was pointing to in his deal size versus number of deals uh, in that VC slide. So as a result, you get an explosion of new services. Anybody here an, an Evernote user? Amazing that that came out of essentially a startup as opposed to a traditional software company. Um, and there's lots more examples like that, whether it's Netflix or Facebook or uh, Salesforce or Untapped or TripIt or any of these things. When you look at how they're built, who builds them, and how they come together, there's this recurring set, a, a set of patterns that I think really defines the new modern application era. So, First of all, they are built by a new generation of developers, kingmakers, also aspirants. Uh, if you look at what's happening as a result of the educational trends that Stephen talked about, um, we're seeing a renaissance in the number of people who want to be developers, especially here in the US. Not sure what it's like in Europe. I was talking to somebody last night uh, uh, from the Orion team about the fact that their local user group is swelling with younger folks. Um, I happen to have uh, a teenage son, and I look at what he and his friends are doing, and the fact that they're already making money, they're getting paid through PayPal, and they're developing careers. It's a very different world than even eight years ago when everybody told us, don't go into comp sci because it's all going overseas. An exciting time. 
Now, these folks, this is their data center. Well, it's probably not this one. It's probably one that's very similar to this. This is actually the picture of an inside of an Azure container. Uh, you know, hundreds of these containers in one of their data centers. I would submit to you that most data centers at most large organizations don't look anywhere near this good, uh, don't have anywhere near this power, and they were a hell of a lot more expensive, and they're quickly becoming obsolete in comparison to what these kingmakers and aspirants have at their disposal. So they are taking advantage of the most advanced data centers on Earth and using them to destroy the traditional barriers to entry when it comes to innovating with software. As a result, the way that we develop is changing substantially. Um, seven things that I'm noticing that recur over and over. Omnichannel clients. So we no longer have the luxury of developing just for Windows anymore, just for a single browser like IE. Multiple platforms, multiple browsers, multiple technology styles, deployed on elastic infrastructures, aggregating discrete services. In my day, you know, we preferred to build everything ourselves. We didn't want to reuse something another development team had built. We certainly didn't want to reuse commercial software because if we had a problem, we were locked out. It's like being an auto mechanic where the hood to your car is well, or you know, a driver where the hood to your car is welded shut. You can't open the hood to see what's wrong. Who wants to do that? Okay? With the advance of open source, with the advance of composable services, REST-based primarily, um, we're seeing devs that are much more likely to look for something to reuse first and to build second. A real mind flip. Um, because of this, the, the advent of managed APIs and even corporate platforms are something that is turning organizations that never thought of themselves as ISVs into folks that act like ISVs. Nike has a developer platform. CBS has a developer platform. MasterCard has a developer platform. Tastycake has a developer platform. And it goes on and it goes on. It's because of the managed API. Now, Open source is a key part of this. We see it in all the data. I've got some slides I'll show you in a, in a little bit. I don't think it's necessarily because it's free as in freedom, or even that it's necessarily free as in beer. It's because it complements the elastic infrastructure so nicely. You don't have to buy for your max capacity. And as we start to see capacity shift up and down to match need, the licensing model of open source is elastic in the same way that the infrastructure is elastic. And this is one of the reasons that I expect to see the domination of open source libraries and open source frameworks continue as we move fully into the modern application era. Now, from a process perspective, there are also some real implications. We see a marked move toward DevOps techniques in the modern application world, and above all, a focus on measuring feedback and time to feedback. And that's where changes to your ALM strategy uh, become the most necessary. Now, we've got a lot of people that think about mobile applications. I really think that mobile applications are missing the point we're now thinking about modern applications. Applications which, yes, uh, have systems of engagement, uh, extensions into all these different devices, but integrate into our existing systems of record, our uh, transactional systems, our application servers, our database management systems, our mainframes. I also think that there's a third component uh, to what's going on here that a lot of folks aren't necessarily looking at yet, but is going to become increasingly more important. I'm calling that the systems of operation tier. You can call it what you want. But it's essentially the, the observable internet, the internet of things, all the other devices that we connect to. Modern applications are going to span all three of these domains. Integrating them is going to be hard. It's going to affect the ALM processes and tools that you use because a modern application is going to have components that have to be delivered in all three of these spheres. Um, about 12 years ago when I moved out here to, uh, to Boston, um, we took a two-week trip to Ireland. Uh, had a great time with the family. Uh, we went and saw castles. I think we must have seen a half dozen castles. Every single castle had a huge chunk taken out of at least one of the walls. And so after we saw this about the third or fourth time, you know, we asked the locals, why are all these castles destroyed? And the answer was, oh, well, when Cromwell came through, they basically took their cannons and they blew all the stone castles to bits and they conquered the country. 
Well, that's what happens when technology advances. Architectures become obsolete. It happens in warfare. It happens in software technology. So what I would submit to you is that the architectures that we have been building for the past 20 years around the first generation of web technology, certainly around client server technologies, are today stone castles. In a sense, we even started to abandon them before the change in modern architectures. Uh, as we started doing more and more work with agile methodologies, we kind of put architecture on the back burner. One of the things that I would tell you is that as we move into the modern application era, we need to prioritize and modernize the architectures we build. In the uh, warfare sense, we need to move from stone castles to uh, earthen forts where the cannonballs bounce off. So what does that mean? We need to think about some different architecture patterns. I'm a real fan of uh, the Gang of Fours book, but also uh, a book uh, called the Bushman book. And uh, the Bushman book focuses on enterprise system patterns. Uh, one of the things I think has happened uh, over the past uh, you know, probably 15 years is we've become ever more dependent on a single system pattern, MVC. MVC is great if uh, you, know, you have scale up uh, middle tiers where state can be managed. As we move to these scale-out infrastructures, uh, move to lots of little servers, uh, move to things like uh, Node.js, I would say that there are different architectural patterns that become more useful. Pipes and filters is one, especially good for content applications where you're transforming content on the fly and making it appear on all the different devices that we now have to support. Also, the broker pattern. If you look at some of these modern architectures, something like LinkedIn's application or something like uh, Untap's application, there's a lot of message passing going on. So one of the things that we as developers are going to have to learn are some new ways to build applications, and we're going to have to think beyond uh, the traditional systems that we have built. Now, when it comes to ALM, I think the first thing, if you're not already in the middle of doing this, that uh, you're going to realize when you start it's really hard to build these applications. Um, first of all, there are cultural challenges. Uh, I tell folks all the time when I'm helping them with mobile strategy, if you are not agile in your organization, you will not succeed building mobile apps. It doesn't matter which technology choice you pick. Um, if you cannot release fast and collect feedback and incorporate it, you will not be successful. If you do not pay more attention to design and to user engagement, you will not be successful. Um, if you do not have an infrastructure that evolves you know, in pieces gradually, you will not be successful. If you cannot build a high quality experience, people aren't going to download your applications and you're going to be one of 500,000 or 700,000 applications in an application store. Sure, somebody can find you if they care, uh, but the likelihood is that they won't and they'll go with higher quality applications for the service that you provide. Modern applications shift the focus of ALM. When I think about the types of systems that I've built over the past 20, five years and, and what our goal was. Um, it's changed depending on what level of uh, system I've been involved with. In the systems of operations uh, phase, I would submit to you that the organizing principle for ALM is all around time to safety. We want to make sure that the plane doesn't fall out of the sky because the software reboots. We want to make sure that we don't have to reburn silicon because we screwed up uh, the software. Time to safety is everything. In the systems of record space, time to certainty was the organizing principle around ALM. We need to make sure that the data doesn't get corrupted uh, because that would be really, really bad. We need to make sure that the transactions are successfully processed. In the systems of engagement tier, time to feedback is everything. We see it over and over, and I'll talk about why that is in a second. So the first thing that you need to understand is when you're putting processes in place, when you're looking for ALM tools, if you're working across all of these domain, domains, you need to have tools and you need to have processes that can adjust to the particular domain you're working in for the particular component of the modern application you're building. So your processes have to be adjustable. It's not, you know, everything is, 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 is a round hole and you're banging round pegs into them. There are different types. So what are we seeing in the systems of engagement tier to deal with this move toward time to feedback as an organizing principle? Well, first of all, um, Scrum 
and other agile practices are a great starting point. But when we look at organizations that are building high quality applications or high quality websites in this space, we see them adapting traditional agile, if I can even say that, uh, with some additional principles and tactics. First of all, a lot more use of personas to drive reasoning about the customers, about the employees that you're integrating with. Uh, we see uh, the, the evolution of something called the journey map, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, and it's got some things in it that you know, most of us as develop developers probably aren't used to thinking about, but that are extremely important. We're seeing a lot more move uh, toward uh, wireframing and rapid prototyping. I can think of one company uh, that I've interviewed recently where they use Craigslist to find a lot of potential customers. They get them in a hotel room. They spend all day doing feedback sessions with them. By the end of the day, they have wireframes uh, and, and prototypes mocked up and ready to go to show the last uh, group of users, or customers, I should say, uh, that are coming in uh, to talk to them about the application. It's that fast. Because of this, we see a move away from the requirements document, the 30 or 40 page thing that's full of thou shouts or we musts. Um, feedback is driving the process. Um, because the releases are much quicker, they're much more atomic in nature, we see a move toward Kanban and flow-based uh, uh, ALM processes because they are more atomic, because it's easier to move discrete requests through the processes. The last piece here is, is kind of interesting to me. Um, we're actually seeing ALM tools as a separable set of things start to merge into the applications that folks are actually building. Analytics are a good example. If you're actually collecting information in the application, that information should feed right back into your ALM process. If you're uh, testing in the runtime, you should be able to essentially take that information and put it right back uh, into the development process. So personas, if you're not doing these as a development shop, you should really start thinking about it because as we build more and more direct customer-facing uh, software, especially in the mobile tier and the tablet tier, uh, we need to understand what the users want, what they are looking for, and more importantly, how they feel about the services that we're offering them. If you look at a journey map, and this is a sample, there are all kinds of different templates and everything, they're useful for a number of different reasons. First of all, it helps you think about the different channels that are part of the service that you're delivering and how those uh, experiences cross different channels. What you need to deliver on the mobile phone, what you need to deliver on the tablet, what can stay on the web application that's running on the desktop or laptop. But one of the other things that you'll see is this, this this nature, uh, the, the, this idea of, of experience, of, of what the user, what the customer is feeling uh, when they produce a particular activity. Why is that important? Well, we know that the thing that is most likely to drive downloads of your services are either that they are rated highly, four plus stars in an application store, or they're a staff pick uh, by the platform that you're looking to support. Now, there's not much you can do about the latter. But when it comes to the former, the way that you can drive good ratings of your applications, of your services, is knowing when to ask for that review. And asking for the review when you know that a user has just completed a task that makes them really happy or makes them feel good is the right time to ask for that four or five star review. And it's a trick that a lot of five star application uh, companies uh, have managed uh, very, very well. Feedback and acting on that feedback and reaching out to those uh, customers uh, becomes a lot more important. As I mentioned, modern applications are complex systems. The reality is, is that we don't know how to build them. So when you think about process and how you would go about putting them into play, um, I've been thinking a lot about using something uh, called the Kinefin framework to contextualize the problem. If you're not familiar with Kinefin, it essentially uh, divides the types of problems that we uh, face, whether we're developers or in any industry, uh, into four different types of problems. Complex problems, complicated problems, chaotic problems, and simple problems. 
Simple problems and complicated problems are the ones that our existing processes and that our existing tools in the ALM space are best designed to handle. If you think about a process like the RUP, it essentially gives you a checklist for dealing with a complicated problem, breaking it into a set of knowable solutions, and then implementing. You sense what the problem is, you analyze the problem, and then you respond in the correct fashion. Well, it doesn't work very well when you don't know what the solution is. You have to engage in different types of behavior. You have to probe the problem, you sense what you get, what you understand when you've probed the problem, and then you respond based on the feedback that you've gotten from your initial testing of the problem. Well, if you look at a modern application and the different systems that it's composed of, what I would submit to you is that most of the challenges that we face in the systems of engagement tier today are kind of somewhere in between the chaotic problem where we don't even know what the problem is yet, let alone how to solve it, and the complex uh, domain where we're still figuring out what the right canonical solutions are to the different design challenges that we face. Um, systems of record, you know, we've been building transactional systems for almost 40 years now. Even though they're a challenge, a lot of them are, we kind of know how to do it now. So we can use those established practices. We can use those prescrip prescriptive processes to build our systems of record and to maintain them. I would have put systems of operation around the same area as systems of record, but I think that we're seeing an interesting evolution here as we move toward the Internet of Things, and as we start to increasingly see systems of operation connected to systems of engagement, not through the systems of record, although that happens, but increasingly direct to the systems of engagement. If you think about the localized infrastructure that your cell phone and your tablet is tapping into and all the devices that it may be communicating to directly, there's a lot of new research to be done there. So even though we understand some of the complex problems of systems of operation, physics doesn't change that much. The user interaction mechanisms and the way in which the systems connect is, is an area where there's still an awful lot uh, to learn, and that makes a lot of those problems complex and unknowable at this point in time. Modern applications evolve. Um, I've borrowed this from, uh, uh, from O'Reilly. It's uh, uh, Amazon's deployment stats for last May. When you look at their mean deployment time, 11.6 seconds, uh, how many deployments they're doing per hour, the number of hosts that they're simultaneously deploying to, there's no way that you do a soup to nuts grand deployment in one fell swoop. In fact, if you start to look at how the infrastructures of these modern applications put to, uh, are put together, I would observe that they look a lot more organic, they evolve, as opposed to mechanic. They come into being and, uh, uh, you know, as holes and they get packaged and, and shipped and put into boxes. So different models from a deployment standpoint. This is causing some real differences in what works when it comes to ALM processes. We're seeing fewer branches in our software uh, uh, configuration management. Uh, we're seeing uh, a strong evolution toward dis distributed version control. You know, of course, Git and GitHub are a huge beneficiary of that. Uh, but uh, you know, there are other products as well uh, that are seeing the benefit of that. We are seeing developers test more often. Um, we are seeing, uh, you know, almost a, a, an, the beginning of the end of the testing center of excellence. Uh, when you think about a feedback-driven process, it's really, really hard to have lots of handoffs between vertical organizations and ra rapidly release. So it means that you know, those of us that are involved in service delivery have to take on more responsibilities as a coordinated team. We see uh, a continuous integration becoming decentralized, more atomic, but also more critical as a component of driving feedback as fast as possible. Um, it's interesting because a lot of the IT shops that I talk to aren't used to being part of betas or dealing with beta software. And as they shift from a let's constrain change by holding our operating systems that we support the same for 10 years, like they did with Windows XP, to a bring your own device reality where 30 or 40 percent of the users upgrade their platforms the weekend after a new version of the platform is released, they are coming to grips with the fact that if they do not test their software in the beta environments before they are released, they introduce unacceptable risk into their application deployment plans. So another way that the traditional companies start to become more like ISVs. 
because of this multi-layer complexity of a modern application, things like mocks, mocking tools, become a lot more critical. You'll see the agencies that are building the systems of engagement basically mock the uh, RESTful interfaces that they need from the IT organization so that they can move forward with development while IT figures out how to make that information available in the JSON payload uh, that they need uh, to satisfy uh, the tablet and the mobile development team. We see a move toward running experiments. Requirements, if they aren't testable, if they don't have a way to evaluate them, aren't valid. Multivariate testing becomes a lot more important. And as part of that, the idea of traffic routing, being able to divert from one set of servers to another and observe the result and instantly cut over becomes a lot more important. Services being architected for continuous deployment, back to the earthen fort, being able to use feature flags or hot patching to be able to turn features on across multiple platforms when you're ready to release, not when you've actually deployed uh, the components of the application. As I mentioned, releases become more organic. Development essentially begins to move away from a software engineering model to a scientific process model. An important difference, uh, but one that we are seeing in that uh, systems of engagement uh, complex uh, problem with an unknowable solution. As a result, how do we test? Increasingly, the answer, which scares a lot of organizations, is in production. For one thing, you don't own the last mile. You don't own the carrier networks. You need to make sure that you really understand how the applications work when they are running on those networks. Uh, because we're using more composable services, things like Urban Airship for pu uh, push messaging, uh, Twilio for integration into the carrier uh, data, it's really a lot harder to test those in isolation in a system testing environment. If you're using big data, you really don't want to have two separate pools of d big data. Uh, you uh, want to be able to, to act on, on this single pool because it's big. You need to harden those services using things like uh, Chaos Monkey and the other monkeys that the Netflix guys have made available through open source. Uh, we see a whole set of open source testing tools, uh, things like Selenium and Cucumber, uh, Fit and Fitness driving uh, this move toward quality. Very different set of principles than what we're used to. Continuous delivery becomes key. Uh, I recently uh, partnered with uh, Jez Humble uh, on a uh, paper and a survey around what's happening in the continuous developer space. And if you're interested, you can get the, uh, uh, the full paper at the link that's at the bottom. Uh, but as part of that, we released a, a maturity model on continuous delivery. Uh, we see these different practices that I've talked about defining an increasingly mature organization. Now, one of the things that I want to say is when you introduce a maturity model, uh, it's dangerous because people all say, well, I want to be at the top. One of the things that I would tell you is you don't necessarily need it to be at the top for all levels of the systems that you're building. In your systems of record, I would say that level three of maturity may be sufficient because you don't need that rapid feedback cycle because you know what you're doing. You can afford to go a little bit longer. But in your systems of engagement tier where feedback matters, you need to take a look at what you need to do to achieve that level of hypothesis-driven delivery where you can run experiments, where you can evaluate the results, where you can quick, uh, quickly uh, uh, iterate. Final thing, software supply chains are maturing. In some way, I think uh, we're at the edge of, of the Napster generation when it comes to software development. And what I mean by that is the one thing that Napster did was it freed the recording artists from the thumb of the music industry. It let them go direct to their consumer, and iTunes was the primary beneficiary of that. I think we're gonna see the same thing happen because developers are the new kingmakers, because of what's happened with OSS, because of the growth of the forge and the communities that are forming around the forge, uh, because of this move toward service composition and the death of not invented here syndrome among developers. We see developers moving from draftsmen to craftsmen. They're creative professionals. They're treating themselves as such. They've got the tools to release these new sets of services and monetize them and not have to worry about business developers or enterprise salespeople or CIOs or CTOs or any of that sort of thing. And if it doesn't work, well, it didn't cost that much to try the idea out, so we can start again and see if the next idea is good. We're seeing the emergence of crowdsourcing, things like Topcoder and Aperio, as a way to source this sort of innovation for those who don't know how to write code. 
because of this, the sources of data are going to be out there in the open source communities. They're going to be out there in these developer collectives. They're going to be out there in GitHub. And as a result, organizations that are looking to tap into all this information and reuse it are going to have to deal with the federation of lifecycle data. I don't see us going back to centralized models as we move toward ALM. It's going to be irrevocably federated. We see this in some of our data. If you now look at where developers are, this is a survey we just completed three weeks ago, uh, 2,000 developers across eight countries. Uh, we see that four out of five developers is now using open source at some level in the systems that they are deploying, have done so within the last 12 months. All developers, not just Java devs or Eclipse devs. We also see this level of craftsmanship emerging uh, almost Three out of four developers now tell us that they write code on their own time outside of their job. That's intrinsic motivation. How many plumbers do you know that plumb when they're not on the clock? Unless it's for a family member, probably not very many. When we ask those developers who write code outside of work on their own time what they're doing, more than a quarter of them, 27%, say that they are contributing to open source projects. That's the community in action, informing, and we see these numbers continuing to grow year after year. We also see distribution becoming more and more important. Only a quarter of teams are now 100% co-located. More than 50% have at least a quarter of the team working remotely, collaborating remotely. So as I think about what all of these things mean, modern applications and their effect on ALM, I would say to you, you need to rethink your approach. First of all, you need to make sure that your ALM processes and tools are fit to the purpose. Don't try to reuse the same tools and processes for your systems of engagement that you are uh, for your systems of operation. There's a different goal. Make sure the tools and the processes fit the goal that you're trying to achieve. Revitalize your architecture. Take your software architects and your enterprise architects and make sure they're helping you figure out how to build those new earthen ramparts instead of the stone castles of the previous generation. Think horizontally in your organization models, not vertically. Organize around service teams. Make sure the businesses are part of those teams. Make sure that they are capable of delivering quickly and getting feedback and using it. Support high-performance teams composed of craftsmen, not draftsmen. That means that you do have to pay your developers at market rate or above. You do have to have a culture that keeps those developers wanting to be a part of your organization, just like you would if you wanted to uh, hire the best musicians or uh, you know, build a company uh, that uh, is a creative performing arts organization. Done. Done means done, in production, in deployment, verified, and working. Not checked in, not tested, not ready to go into the system test environment. If you want to get rapid feedback, you've got to be focused on the end and be responsible for it, no matter what role you have on that service team. Finally, understand how your tools are going to help you federate and collaborate with the open source communities, uh, with the new sourcing models that are emerging. If you have your own little castle of data, you're increasingly going to become unable to take advantage of the innovation that's happening out in the open source community that's driving these modern applications. Final point, make it fun and rewarding, okay? People that are, are creatives do it because they love it, because it's who they are. It's why musicians play, it's why artists paint, and it's why developers write software. So make sure that you inject some of that into your ALM thinking. Thank you.